All right. In this video, we're going to uh, introduce the topic of physiology, um, its organization, the division into uh, particular categories, as well as talk a little bit about it, uh, the functions of physiological systems. So what is physiology? Well, physiology, uh, anything ending in ology, is a uh, study of, and this is uh, the study of bodily function. And so it's really about understanding how our organs and tissues work uh, to keep us alive, right? To provide the functions, the, the necessities of life um, that our cells require to keep us alive and functioning. All right. Well, that's a very broad sort of array of objectives. Um, let's talk a little bit about what those the functions of physiological systems are in general. So let's talk about the functions. And there really aren't that many. Uh, there, some of them are pretty broad, um, but if we if we sort of list those key functions of physiological systems, uh, I would say one of the big ones, and one you might be fairly familiar with, uh, is homeostasis. And homeostasis, we're going to do a separate video on the components of homeostatic regulation and things like that. Um, but you probably heard the definition uh, as, of homeostasis as being regulation or maintenance of internal balance. I like to be uh, fairly specific with that de definition. And I say, and again, I'll reiterate this in a separate video, but the maintenance of a relatively stable internal environment. And that's easily remembered if you look at this word that has two parts. Right? Stasis refers to state, in other words, the condition of the, uh, the system that we're talking about here. And homeo means similar. So homo means same and homeo means similar. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a similar term, but not the same. Right? So it means similar state. What that means is it's uh, a keeping our internal environment, um, we'll be more specific about that later, but the internal environment of our body at a relatively stable, in a relatively stable state, right? And that's going to include a whole bunch of parameters and qualities that we'll, we'll talk about later. Um, the purpose of that is really twofold, right? There are actually two things that maintaining homeostasis does for us. One has to do with proteins. and specifically what's called the marginal stability of proteins. And again, we'll talk more about this later when we get to um, homeostasis specifically. But really what it means is, the marginal stability terms, means that proteins are somewhat fragile. And so if we upset this internal environment, we can upset the protein structure. And when the proteins aren't properly shaped, formed, um, then they don't work right. Right? And that would be bad because we're talking about enzymes and channels and pumps and lots of functional molecules that without their uh, working properly, we wouldn't work properly. Uh, the other key element that homeostasis helps or provides for uh, is it's, it, it supplies an environment that, uh, that aids the energetics of our cells. Right? So I'm going to say provides for. cellular energetics. And the, and the reason that's true is that some of the homeostatic parameters, if you will, components of that internal environment are essential for uh, cells producing uh, energy in a form that is uh, easily uh, transmissible uh, within the cell. And that is ATP. 
right? And remember, energy can't be produced. So what we're, what's really happening here uh, can't be produced or destroyed. But what's really happening here is bond, energy uh, within the bonds of some molecules is, are being transferred to, through a whole variety of re, uh, chemical reactions, to ATP. And then that bond energy is being transferred uh, to do other things, right? And so uh, those are really our two main components within homeostasis. And again, more on that later. Uh, as far as physiological functions, let's move to our number two here, and that would be energetics. All right, so in other words, here we're going to provide oxygen and nutrients to make ATP. Well, the reactions that do all of that are would be under this umbrella of the cellular energetics, right? That's not maintaining the state, the internal state of the body, again, as I define it. Um, that is uh, separate from the cellular energetics, right? The intracellular actions uh, of a cell, you know, acquiring and using energy to produce ATP. Okay, and homeostasis certainly, so in other words, one and two are linked, at least, uh, well, and actually for both of these, because again, energetics is going to revolve around uh, reactions, uh, sequences like glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, which is made up of proteins, right, enzymes. And of course, marginal stability is important for those uh, uh, proteins and uh, enzymes involved in those energetic reactions. So again, one and two are going to be linked. Uh, the third main function I'm going to list here for physiological function is growth and reproduction. Um, growth, so the, the key element uh, in that term um, would be cell division, right? Um, and of course, that's going to be tied to energetics as well as homeostasis that are all tied together. Um, but growth means, you know, cell division and, and acquiring uh, tissue mass, whereas reproduction, so mitosis, right? Reproduction is more about meiosis and the production of gametes for propagation of the species. Right, and again, that's not; those aren't homeostatic mechanisms. Those aren't a maintenance of an environment. Those are those are are processes, physiological processes, but it's not about maintaining an internally stable environment. And then the last main function of physiological systems would be control. Right. So if you think about um, the nervous system, for instance, or hormonal systems, uh, it's called the endocrine system. Right? Those systems exist to regulate these uh, first three, essentially. Right? In other words, we need to be able to control growth and reproduction. We need to be able to regulate uh, tissue oxygen levels right? up here in homeostasis or, or carbon dioxide levels or nutrient levels. Right? And so we have to have a mechanism of control. Uh, and that's really about being able to sense and respond. Right? We need to be able to see what is happening, uh, and then we need, need to be able to respond when things are abnormal. Right? Okay, so those are your main functions of physiological systems. Now, let's talk a little bit about the levels at which physiology can be studied. Uh, and so they span quite an array, right? We can study physiology at the molecular level, right? We could study uh, hemoglobin. We could study the sodium potassium pump. We could study the enzymes of the Krebs cycle, right? All of those are important molecules that are tied to physiological functions. So we can, we can examine physiology at the molecular level. Or we can bump up and study, I'm just sort of going up in scale here. We could study um, physiology at the cellular level. What, is, what are individual cells doing? Uh, how are they um, responding to stimuli? What are the, what's the cell producing? Things like that. Is the cell contracting? Lots of different things we could study at the cellular level. If we bump up another level, we are now at the 
what's called the tissue level. And tissues are combinations of uh, similar cells uh, to serve particular functions, right? So uh, there were actually only four main tissue types, right? Um, I should learn this in uh, introductory uh, physiology uh, one, right? When you talked about um, muscle tissues and nervous tissue and epithelial tissue and connective tissue, right? These are these are categories of uh, cellular groups that sort of perform, have similar characteristics and perform particular types of functions, right? If we go up from the tissue level, now we take basically tissues and combine them, we end up with what are called organs. Right, so we end up at the organ level, right? So we can study physiology at the level of the heart or the lungs or the liver. If we go up one more, bring it down here, we go to the organ system. And there, we're now we're talking about things like the cardiovascular system, right? So now you're it's a combination of organs, the heart and the blood vessels. Right. And so in that case, right, the heart doesn't do us much good without blood vessels to convey that blood to the tissues that uh, require that blood flow. Right. And so it's a combination of uh, organs working together to perform particular functions. OK, so the last thing I want to talk about uh, in this little introductory lecture here uh, is a little bit about um, why organ systems exist. Why do we have them? And I don't want to get into a, a broad discussion of evolution, um, but what we do want to understand, right, we're going to spend most of this course studying these organ systems, right? We're going to study the heart, the blood vessels, the the lungs, the kidneys, the digestive tract, right? Those are organ systems, organs and organ systems. Why do they, why, at least for many of them, why do they exist? And a lot of it boils down to as organisms evolved, they went from single cellular organisms, let's call that a single cell right there, to organisms that became colonial. They started to live in groups, right? And they started to look like this. And what happens here, so imagine this as being a ball of cells now. And the problem is over here, this, this single cell, this cell easily exchanges nutrients and gases and wastes with the environment. It's sitting there floating in a pond or wherever, the ocean, right? And it readily exchanges with the environment. This, uh, this guy, this ball of cells, um, it does the same thing, but now it has cells on the inside that are no longer directly in contact with the environment. And so what happens is that it becomes diffusion limited. And the problem here is that as size goes up, right? So as the size of an organism increases, what happens is its relative surface area decreases. Decreases. Right? And so what that means, not, not its actual surface area, but its relative surface, surface area. What I mean is, um, you know, you don't want to compare two different size organisms, right? A bigger organism obviously has a larger surface area. What I'm talking about is its uh, surface area relative to its size. So as, as these organisms get bigger, right, its relative surface area actually falls. And what that means is it has, as it gets larger, it, the amount of uh, surface area it has for exchanging with the environment actually becomes more and more limiting. And that's bad, right? That's how this organism gets oxygen, gets rid of carbon dioxide, right? Um, again, when we're talking about this clump of cells here, right? Well, if we take this, you know, another step, right? And we end up with an organism that's not, you know, 50 or 100 cells. I'm just going to sort of make this more rapid, right? We end up with, keep it as a sort of a ball shaped organism, right? But now what's going to happen is the cells in the middle here, let me highlight some of them, cells somewhere in the middle here 
right, are so far from the environment over here that they can no longer exchange, directly exchange with it, right? It becomes diffusion limited. And what, what we need now is cooperation uh, amongst these cells, right? The cells on the outside are like, oh, okay, like, and again, this is through... This is through natural selection and evolution, multiple, many, many, many generations of change where some cells became adapted to acquire oxygen. Other cells became adapted to excrete wastes, right? Other, other you know, systems evolved to transport things from the cells in the interior to those tissues, those organ systems that exchanged with the environment. Right? So if you think about it, your lungs are all about exchanging with the environment, gases. Your kidneys are all about exchanging with the environment, wastes. Your digestive tract is all about exchanging with the environment, nutrition. Right? And so there's multiple organ systems whose evolutionary adaptive function is to exchange with the environment and then provide that quote-unquote service to the cells of the rest of the organism, right? And so those are the evolutionary pressures, right? The increase in size and the multicellularity and then the, the sort of the decrease in the uh, effectiveness of diffusion sort of led to the adaptive uh, evolution of organ systems that would provide for the needs of a much larger organism, right? This multicellular organism. Okay.